asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Now, last week it was alleged by the UK government that Twitter was using, excuse me, Russia was using bot accounts, basically electronic accounts, basically, some, how would you describe a bot account? Well, it's not a human. It's a computer-generated system putting out stories and putting out comments. And the UK government said this is going on. Russia is using bot accounts, non-human accounts, to spread disinformation. And they named a number of people that are patently not bots, but are in fact human beings. And one of them is our first uh, guest today. Now, he is a blogger and a, uh, I would say, a political analyst who's got a huge following on Twitter where he tweets, it's at Ian, I-A-N, 56789. He challenges the UK mainstream media narrative on Syria and many other issues. Now, on Friday, Sky News rang him up and they said, um, come on and have a chat with us about your account and what you tweet and are you a bot and all of that. So Ian said, no problems, I'll come on and I'll have a chat with you. So we're going to hear a couple of clips from that particular interview now. He's being interviewed by a woman called Sarah Houston and a, and, and a pundit called Alastair Bunkle. So let's just have a listen to how some of that went. This is Ian uh, Schilling live on Sky on Friday afternoon. It's brilliant stuff really is. Have a listen. You are denying that you're a Russian bot. You're saying you have absolutely no links with the Kremlin. So the material that you retweet, the government's identified 100 posts a day from your account, uh, 1,300 no, posts well, in 12 oh. days. How do you check the veracity of the information that you retweet, the people that you're retweeting, do you know them? Do you have Kremlin contacts? I have no Kremlin contacts whatsoever. I do not know any Russians. I have no contact with the Russian government or anything to do with them. I've got no contact with spy. I am an ordinary British citizen, ordinary British citizen, who happens to do research on what is going on in the current neocon wars which are being fought in Syria at this very moment. I, uh, I check out what is happening by credible, credible journalists. Now, there aren't any of those on Sky News. And there aren't any others in, in the whole of the Western media. The only people that, the only people that are, are reporting with a, with a voice of reason or sanity or honesty are Peter Hitchens, who's questioned why the hell would Assad use chemical weapons when he's winning? And Tucker Carlson in the US, who said the same thing. Fantastic stuff. There are no journalists on Sky News, he said, to the shock of the presenter standings there. And then they opened the door for Ian to talk a little bit about the conflict of interest. Alleged contract, con well, more than alleged, but the alleged conflict of interest surrounding Theresa May, her husband, BAE, of course, British uh, Aerospace Engineering, which is an arms manufacturing company, and dropping bombs on Syria. Listen to another minute of this and then we'll introduce the man himself. Do you ever worry that inadvertently you might be part of a Kremlin propaganda machine? Inadvertently. No. no. The question is, what does it mean by being pro-Britain or pro-American? Does it mean being pro the interests of 60 million British people, or does it mean the clique in the UK government, the cabinet, that are doing things for their own personal benefit and their cronies in the arms companies, BAE systems? Theresa May's husband runs a large hedge fund or private equity fund, which is the largest shareholder of BAE systems. Do you think BAE systems went up because Theresa May started bombing Syria? Yes, they did. She's got a conflict of interest. That's one. So uh, uh, I am speaking for the vast majority of British people. 59.9 million out of 60 million English people or Scots. I, I'm not speaking for the UK government who do not work for the British people. And they plainly okay. ignore the wishes of the British people because hardly anyone in Britain wants Theresa May to bomb Syria. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Ian blogs at ian56.blogspot.co.uk. That's ian56 
dot blogspot dot co dot uk. Let's welcome to the and we'll tweet out links to find him on Twitter. I've mentioned his Twitter account already. Let's welcome to the show Ian Schilling. Ian, that was absolutely brilliant, mate. How are you? Thanks, Richie. Hi. It was terrific stuff. The background to this Ian, was was that last week a number of journalists, partisan. Uh, girl. Well, there's no journalists, Richie. Now, let's, let's make this clear. There's no journalists in these articles, OK? Hacks. 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 Yeah, no, no, no. I was, I was making the point that last week the UK government said that many of those people who are asking questions about Syria are, in fact, bot accounts. I'm thinking about people like Partisan Girl, uh, yeah. but Vanessa Bailey, others were accused of being bots like your own account. Yeah. How... Uh, Ian, I, I've never claimed to be the brightest man in the world. How could they not realise very easily that your account is a personal account, somebody who's doing his own investigations into these stories and tweeting his opinions? How could they think it was a Russian bot? Well, it's impossible to think that, if you are any way reasonable. I mean, from the history of this, the person that's that's triggered all this, initiated it, is Ben Nimmo from DFR Lab Atlantic Council. And he has been harassing me and smearing me and slandering me, libeling me on Twitter for six months, regularly. He's done, he tweets out, I'm a Russian bot, Russian bot, all the time. And it's impossible. If you've been following me for six months, he can see I'm replying to people, I'm doing my tweets, and then I, I make some comment whether I think this is believable or not, or right or wrong, or whatever. I can't be a bot making opinions and doing intellectual decision making. No, and debating people, and arguing with debating people. Debating people, yeah. Or I think... supplying, somebody says something, and I say, oh, that's not right, and I go and link out and post it back in two minutes. How can you be a bot? It, it absolutely flabbergasted me that patently obvious human beings were being accused of running bot accounts. I think with you, it's obvious that you are completely and utterly independent. You're not working for, you know, a company in Russia. You're not an employee of a Russian television station. You've got nothing to do with the Syrian government you just put out opinions, well thought out pieces that you put out on your blog site as well as your Twitter site, and you do it prolifically, which is which is pretty excellent. And it's challenging what is, you know, and again, it's obvious that my opinion is not entirely objective. I've got a very definite opinion about what's going on in Syria. But it's obvious that while you're doing that, the official narrative is falling apart at the seams, Ian. Yeah, well, they're getting worried. I mean, what I do is my hobby. It's my, I'm retired. So it's my hobby. Some people do gardening or they do bowling or they do snooker or golf or something. I do this. I do, I, you know, I look at the news and analyse the news. That's what I do. That's my hobby. We're going to get a lot of tweets on this. If, if you've got a comment to make on this, folks, go to at Richie Allen Show. It's at Richie Allen Show. By the way, I've already mentioned it, but uh, do follow Ian. Ian, uh, his Twitter handle is at Ian56789. Couldn't be simpler. At Ian, I-A-N, 56789. So they call you up on Friday. It made me laugh. And I suppose it's indicative of how lazy, because I come from a commercial radio background, commercial media. So I've been in the position those presenters found themselves the other day. But it's probably indicative of how lazy they've become, Ian. They don't often get presented with, the presenters, I mean, don't often get faced with somebody who is going to take them on and exactly. challenge exactly. them. They don't get called out. They, they don't they get never... called out, no, no. And when you said to them, there's no journalism on Sky News, it was absolutely fantastic. Well, they expect to be able to get away with anything because nobody will call them out with you know, with any any traction, any any you know publicity. And that's what they expect. That's why they expect to get it. It's no good one person replying back and saying you're talking a load of garbage as a reply to their tweet, is it? No one's going to see that. So they they think they can get away with everything. When um when I, when I said that you were coming on today, some of our listeners contacted me and they said, "Oh, Richie, now you better be fair now." You know, you, 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 you've, 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 you've got a challenge, Ian. I said, well, I'm going to have a conversation with Ian. And uh, <laughs> it was what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a chat with him. I like what he, what he writes and I like what he said on Sky. But 
there, there, there is always another side. Whether they're wrong or whether they're right, let other people decide. And they might say, where do you get your information from, Ian? And I know Sky News asked you this question the other day. They asked, it, through them, it was a loaded question designed to try and embarrass you. Um, certainly not for me, of course, in any way. It's not loaded. But, you know, people might say, we're all living on the internet now. And, and I've had it said to me all the time, Richie, how do you know your sources are reliable. And sometimes I have to say, well, I just believe them or I just trust them. P- putting that question to you, Ian, how do we know for a fact that our sources are reliable? It's, it's, it's a matter of their history, their reporting history. If they've got a solid record of reporting the truth for, say, three years about Syria or something, and everything they've written has proved to be true by later evidence or something else happening or whatever else, you could say that's a credible journalist, can't you? <clears throat> you know, if they've, if they've been, been posting out re- articles regularly about what's been going on and everything they've written has proved to be correct with subsequent evidence or whatever. They've had form and... They've got form of telling the truth. Right, that's the only way you can tell. Right, so I followed people, and I thought they were telling the truth, and then they go, oh, "That's not right." I stopped following them. I don't post. They don't post their articles anymore because they're not telling me the truth. But I, there's, there's lots of people on the ground in Syria with a with a really in depth knowledge of what's going on in Syria. There's Eli Magnio, who's, who's Syria. There's a few other people in the Syrians that I follow. There's Vanessa Beedy. There's Eva Bartlett. There's Oh, I don't know. There's 20 people that I consider credible journalists on Syria. Well, yeah, there's an Englishman living there as well, isn't there, called Tom Duggan, who's been fairly prolific talking about what's happening in Damascus as well. Yeah. Um, and, and as you said, the the likes of the BBC and Sky News, their form, and you've only got to look back, I suppose, at Libya, which is recent enough, and before that, Iraq, their form has been to, well, to 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 lie pathologically, Ian. Well, yeah, they're hundred percent lies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's very difficult to find an article that's truthful. Like, it's the exact opposite of a Vanessa Beeney, who tells the truth all the time. Sky News tells li- lies all the time. BBC tells lies all the time. The Times tells lies all the time. All of them tell lies all the time. All the mainstream media, all lies, all of the time. Yeah, it's ninety nine percent of the time. Whatever. Just lies. Yeah. I want to talk in a minute about how you got into it because I believe Iraq and September 11th was what was um, was a big deal for you in terms of how you started yeah. looking into reporting. I know you've got a background in finance. I know you've been a, a stock market broker, um, which is interesting as well. And I want to talk about Philip May. I mean, I thought you know the the, the line about. Sky News having having no journalists was was wonderful. It was a fantastic soundbite, but <laughs> but dropping in there, you know, to the presenters, you do know by the way that Theresa May's husband is a hedge fund manager, uh, yeah. manages a portfolio which has a lot of money invested in BAE, which obviously stood to gain when the decision was made to bomb Syria. It was absolutely fantastic, and yeah. indicative, I suppose, of just how bad the media is. I mean, this is information that's in the public domain. You've only got to just do a little bit of scratching around and you'll find out who Philip May is. And then you are duty bound as a reporter to report that. You must yeah. tell, because that's in the national interest. Yeah. Uh, isn't it, it Ian? Be. <laughs> yeah. But, 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 but no mention of it. And I'm sure until you mentioned it on Friday, regular Sky News viewers would never have heard that. Yeah, of course they wouldn't. Sky's never going to volunteer that information. The BBC are never going to volunteer it, are they? I'm amazed they brought you on, to be honest. I really <laughs> I'm still kind I'm of scratching my head. <laughs> I managed to be able to talk and get these points out. Once once I said that there's no journalists on Sky, I thought they were going to cut me off. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were... Do you know, because I, I didn't see it on Friday, and my, my listeners are diligent, and I got a number of uh, tweets this morning asking me had I seen it and I said no I hadn't so I watched it and stuck it on and I thought it was about nine minutes long and when you mentioned that it was like halfway through and I thought oh he survived that uh, they, <laughs> they, they kept them on because because only the week before one of the UK's most senior military figures was basically dumped off the air 
for saying what you've been saying on your Twitter account, that is, why would the Assad government, why would it want to use chemical weapons on anybody when it is in the, it is in the ascendancy in dealing with these terrorists? Go ahead, talk about that, because it's absolutely true. Yeah, well, I mean, Rand Paul went on CNN and said, unless Assad is the stupidest dictator in the entire world, he didn't do it. Like, so Rand Paul said it, um, Pitchin said it, and said, why the hell would Assad use chemical weapons when he's we almost defeated all of the terrorists and he's winning? Why the hell would he use chemical weapons? He wouldn't. I said it on the interview. He wouldn't. And Tucker Carlson said the same thing. He had a, he had a 10 minute or so monologue on it and I had videos saying, well, this doesn't make sense. Why the hell would Assad want to use chemical weapons so he can bomb him? No, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, but they're, they're the only voices who are, are talking any with any sense. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science, is it? It's not rocket science. So there was there was Major General Shaw, wasn't there? Who yeah. used to be head of the UK Special Forces, the SAS. And he used to be commander of the British Army in Iraq for a while. I mean, he's no mug, is he? He knows what's going on. And apparently he used to be in charge of the chemical weapons section at one point as well. And he's not a mug. He knows. No, and I, his, his, it, his comments were fairly balanced, Ian, because he did say at the beginning of that segment that, well, pretty much everybody tries to muddy the waters. Now, that's a fair comment to make, because regardless of what we think, I mean, I, I'm glad, obviously, that Russia has prevented the West turning Syria into a lunatic asylum as as Libya was turned into. So I'm yeah. glad Russia made the right decision because I don't believe the stories that well, Bashar has... Made, made a mistake in not vetoing that Libya resolution that allowed all the bombing. That's know? right. Historically, that's absolutely right. You know, it's, inter it's interesting that the, the Foreign Affairs Committee report into the Libya disaster, which is incredibly critical of David Cameron... Oh, they were lying their asses Absolutely. Off, but you know, there's no mention the of that. Story total, totally made up and that uh, Gaddafi was bombing so many. That's uh, right. And when they went and looked at uh, all the people that died, the 97% were military age people and there was 3% women and children. Well, if there's a war, you're going to get some in casualties. How we managed to keep it down about 3 or 5% women and children is bloody amazing. That's right. It was Crispin Blunt that authored that report. It was only in 2015. It's a scathing a report that you could possibly yeah. get. He annihilates the government, basically says you're a pack of liars. You exaggerated, you know, at the very least, you lied about the opposition because the opposition weren't really, you know, Libyans. They were lunatic jihadists that were in the country. They were Libyan Islamic fighting group who, yeah. were, who were announced publicly that they were allied with Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden from 1996. So the, the UK government and the Americans knew he's with Al-Qaeda Wahhabi extremists. Yeah. They were terrorists. I'm going to say something to you now. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be entirely, well, I, gen I generally am, um, you know, entirely honest. I try to be entirely honest all the time. I've, um, I've been making independent programs for a long time. And I'm not crazy about the activist journalists. Now, I've got to say this for the 500th time. I don't have any personal issues with anybody who's based in Syria because I've never met them and I've never had any interaction with them apart from occasionally interviewing them. But I find it difficult, Ian. I, what I try to do on this programme is I try and get the person, you know, the average Joe and Josephine Smith to, to consider a different point of view, to consider a different explanation for what's happened in, in Syria. So I present right. people like you right? Because you're completely independent, you're a very good writer, and you're articulate. But there are activist journalists in Syria, and I, I think there's a great shame in that some of them have made no secret of their admiration for Bashar al-Assad. I have no problem with that, because as far as I'm concerned, Bashar al-Assad, his family, and his government are not remotely responsible for the situation that Syria finds itself in today at all. But yeah. I, believe, I believe it's difficult. You mentioned Vanessa earlier on, who's done 
some very interesting work on the White Helmets group. And I would have a lot of sympathy with what Vanessa Bealey has said about the White Helmets. I would have a lot of sympathy. But I can't sell that to ordinary people because Vanessa has gone on the record as saying that I'm, it was the biggest honour of my life meeting Bashar al-Assad. I think journalism is in a weird place, Ian. You're either a journalist or you're not. We shouldn't... But, activism but, and I mean, journalism shouldn't meet. Vanessa, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's not just Vanessa Beattie or Eva Bartlett or is saying that. There's loads and loads of uh, video clips on Twitter. Agreed. In the white helmets, faking stuff. Agreed, but these are the more prominent ones is the point I'm making. And I think yeah. it's a shame. And others are people who appear nightly on RT, which again, when you share that information, I mean, a friend of mine who works look, in... Look, look, real hard, credible evidence. Really hard data, okay? Aleppo was liberated from al Nusra terrorists in December 2016, wasn't it? Yes. When they defeated all the terrorists in, in Aleppo. Right? And in the six months that followed it, 500,000 Syrians came back to live in Aleppo. Yes. Uh, is, is this had this monster? Why are all these people coming back to live? I mean, it's all bombed out. It wasn't a very nice place to live when they all came back because most of their houses have been bombed. You know? And that's, so, that's a 100% stone cold fact. Do you know? That's on, UN. That's the UN numbers. That's so their own you, numbers. You yeah. could argue with that one. Nobody. And, and like I said, I, the final thing I would say on that is I would advise any journalist, no matter how passionately you feel about right and wrong and who's right and who's wrong, don't align yourself or become embedded with one side or the other because it's yeah, difficult. It's it's, yeah, you can't it's, do that. It's and that's a problem, yeah. Passionate. You're just you're not going to think clearly, are you? Not going to be critically thinking. You've got to apply critical thinking to everything. So you can't worship anybody. You, you worship nobody. You believe nobody, and you work from empirical data about what is the best bit of the evidence. That's what you do. What are you thinking is going to happen now? We had this bombing of Syria um, two, 10, 11 days ago completely illegal. It was outrageous that... It's a war crime, yeah. It was a war crime that May would do it and not consult Parliament, even though legally they allege she didn't have to do that. Russia stood by the Assad government. They are driving the Western trained and funded jihadists, it must be said, out of the country now. I don't believe, though, that the United States, the UK... France, Israel, they're determined to turn Syria upside down. What do you they think is going to happen to now? They prolong the war. Yeah. They don't want the war to finish. They don't want the terrorists defeated. So what they will... want to prolong it. They want Syria to remain in permanent... If they can't topple Assad, which they, you know, they've lost that chance, haven't they? But, but the, their next chance is to occupy Syria... And and destabilize it as much as possible. Steal the oil. See, see, the the Americans don't re don't need the oil. They don't really want the oil because it's pitiful amount. Yeah, you know, it's not like Iraq with huge oil fields, but it's very important to Assad, who's running a, on a budget on a shoestring, running the Syrian government. Those oil revenues are really important part of his revenue. See, a big percentage. So they want to stop Assad having that, so he can't rebuild his country. You know, this, that's why they got the oil, not because they want the oil. They want to stop us sad having it. So what? what's next then in terms of looking at well, this from, from the point of view of, you know, Russia said that it didn't respond to the attacks 11 days ago because its red lines weren't crossed. Russia yeah. has been very measured and very calm yeah. throughout this. So you have that. What would you expect from the NATO country, uh, the, the NATO governments? What do you expect the UK, the US, France and so on to do next? Well, Nikki Haley and Emmanuel Macron have said that they, I think somebody else in the American government, has said that they are going to permanently occupy Syria. Okay, They put some gas that said, oh, we'll leave when our objectives are, are, are are accomplished, okay? What are your objectives? Oh, we're not going to say, so we can stay there forever. <laughs> and then there's Israel, who's still supporting the um, 
the ISIS and Al Qaeda terrorists that have still got a hold on the on the uh, border area of the Golan Heights. There's still a cluster of um, Al Qaeda and ISIS terrorists there, and their ISIS are still uh, Israel is still supporting those. And there's pockets in the Yarmouk Palestinian refugee camp that ISIS have got some part of that Assad is now attacking there. There's a question of what Turkey's going to do because Turkey's being pulled between America and Russia because Turkey hates the Kurds and America is supporting the Kurds. So this is two NATO countries at loggerheads. You know, they're, they're getting to the point of armed conflict between them. Turkey could fire off a few artillery rounds and hit some American soldiers and kill them. I mean, that's a possibility. The other possibility is the terrorists in Idlib or somewhere else are going to stage another false flag chemical weapons attack. So it gives the pretext to America and the UK to bomb. And this time for real, not some not some fireworks show that didn't do any damage. Some real, I mean, because Lindsey Graham, the nut jobs, the real nut jobs, are saying, well, oh, he should have launched a, a three month bombing campaign and destroyed the entire Syrian army. And that, that's all the Al Qaeda back in, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, crazy. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but you could say it's a tinderbox. That situation you described, yeah, is. that well, um, I hypothesis. I think anybody knows what's going to happen. Yeah. All we can say is there's lots of possibilities and there's lots of people with conflicting interests. And America and France are saying they're going to permanently occupy. And Macron said he's going to send French troops to the Kurdish area. And America's already got about 10 airfields, air bases, haven't they, in the, in the Kurdish area. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Let me read a few tweets, Ian, and then we, I, I want to talk a little bit about politics here and the opposition. And the question begs, is there even a genuine opposition to what's happening in Syria? Because I think ultimately your contention that the the West or the Western countries involved in Syria won't go anywhere. I think you're right. I think ultimately they want to bring about a situation where the country is partitioned. I think that's what they want to do. I really believe yeah. that. Let me read a few tweets um, here. People are talking about emailing MPs. Tony says, um, I emailed my MP who happens to be pretty Patel over 10 days ago. I was polite, but I got no response uh, to that. Um, let me scroll on down. Gojira tweets, Ian is actually a well-informed Russian sex bot. That's Gojira there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's the comment of the day. <laughs> if we had a prize, if we had a prize for a comment of the night, um, let me scroll on down. Hi to Moinga, by the way. Keep the tweets coming in. It's that Richie Allen show. Base Ninja tweets all the points Ian has raised. I suggest all who listen tonight to confront your MPs directly to see what kind of response we get. I'm still waiting for uh, my response. Uh, he says there. Andrew Christie tweets. How are you doing, Andrew? Richie, as a Scot, for me. This is a perfect example of a true Englishman on the show tonight. Intelligent, clearly, clearly eccentric, he says, and, and mad as a hatter. Happy St. Saint, <laughs> happy Saint George's Day. I love this guy, says Andrew. Um, he might be eccentric, but he's certainly not uh, mad at all. Sarah says, it's a, Sarah, Sarah Rapley says, it's an absolute tonic on St. George's Day to listen to at Ian56789 on uh, the Richie Allen show there. Uh, keep those tweets coming in. Loads of them coming in. It's that Richie Allen show. Anything you'd like to say to Ian? Uh, Cartoon Drunk tweets, amazing that Ian got to say what he did say. Uh, the bloke they had on Sky News where he said, why would Assad use chemical weapons as he's winning the Syrian war and was cut short? That's uh, Jonathan Shaw, of course. Yeah. What, what Ian said was dynamite. It was um, absolutely dynamite. Ian, is there... Is there an opposition? What do you think of the likes of Jeremy Corbyn when it comes to this? If Jeremy Corbyn, if this government was to come down because of the Windrush scandal or if it was to come down over Brexit and Corbyn was to lead a coalition to victory or to lead Labour to victory and then form a coalition government, do you think things would, would settle down and there might be a more... Uh, a more sane approach to Syria with a Corbyn government. Do you think the CIA or MI5 are going to allow, allow Corbyn to become Prime Minister? Well, you see, this is it. Well, well, if you believe that Corbyn is genuine, then probably the answer is no. If you believe that he's a genuine socialist who's completely honest and is an absolutely committed anti-war um, politician, yes, 
I would say yes, they wouldn't allow him get in. But is he? Could it be argued that the Blairites in that party are still calling the shots? Ian, what do you think? Well, he's got a real battle, isn't he? He's got his party split down the middle. Almost. So all these bloody Blairite neocons, they all want war, don't they? They're just as bad as Blair bombing bloody Iraq and invading. They they, they want to bomb the shit out of everybody. So the Blairites are terrible. I mean, Cor- if Corbyn wants to be prime minister, he's got to kick all those Blairites out. He's got to, uh, got to, got to do each constituency and get, get a Corbyn porter to run, to be MP. These, he's got to do that. That's the only these, way he's going to be legend. able to be MPM. They're trying to undermine him. Now all the Blairites are, in, are, are slandering him about this all this anti-Semitism nonsense when he's not anti-Semitic. He just, he just says, well, Israel shouldn't be beating the shit out of Palestinians. That's what he says, yeah. which is fair enough. So, but then that, because of, if you're not maybe pro-Israel, then, of course, you're an anti-Semite, don't it? I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You can't so, win. I want to talk about that. Um, Ian Schilling is our guest, uh, by the way. If um, if this is the first time you've heard of Ian, um, Ian is a, is a political analyst. He's a journalist. You can find him at ian56.blogspot.co.uk. Check it out. He writes about geopolitics. He writes a lot about what's happening in the Middle East as well. And he's a prolific um, tweeter of information. Um, most of it, I would say, most of it, I don't know, I can't say all of it, but I would say most of it is um, factually correct and challenges establishment propaganda on Syria. That's what he does. And it was alleged that Ian and others weren't real people, that they were Russian bot accounts, which was ridiculous and farcical. So Sky News asked Ian to come on. They probably thought... Well, we've not seen much of this gentleman on television before. We'll bring him on. We'll make him look like a bit of an Egypt, as we say yeah, in Ireland. Be a piece of cake looking the Absolutely. Piece of cake. But yeah. it, it backfired like a cheap car in their faces <laughs> um, because Ian was able to say um, some very important things during that interview, which is available on YouTube, by the way. And you can find it by going to Ian's own Twitter account, which is at Ian56789. It was really a sensational television moment. One of the highlights of the year. I have to watch this garbage every day of the week, Sky News, to report on what the mainstream media is doing. I don't often get a treat like that. I didn't see it live. I saw it today. It was brilliant to see Ian ask these questions and to shame these journalists. And, and this is the thing, Ian. It is shameful for these people to be taken on by by anybody. You know, a really good television presenter or a really honest journalist should not find themselves in a situation like that where they are being torn to pieces in the manner that you, you know, t- 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 yeah, it, it t- t- took these people down. It shouldn't be my credibility or authenticity or honesty yeah. in question. I'm telling the truth. It should be all the political hacks in the mainstream media that are constantly telling lies or parroting the government lies. These should be the ones that are in the dock saying, you're lying, you're guilty of not being a free press, you're not You're not doing what the fourth estate, the fourth estate is supposed to check what the government is saying and and research whether it's truthful, whether it's whether it's verifiable, or whether it's totally false and ridiculous lies. They're supposed to be. They're supposed to do research. That's what they're supposed to do to check whether the government is telling the truth or not. And if the government isn't telling the truth, they are supposed in banner headlines, front page, Theresa May lied about blurb. So. You know, they could they could have said, you know, David Cameron lied about about Libya. No, these are all Al Qaeda terrorists is supporting. No, see, but they don't, do they? You could have a job in the city. You could have a job in a factory. You could have a job anywhere. And if you're found to be mendacious, you're going to lose your job, and you're going to find yourself picking up your P forty five and scouring job centres for another job. These people's perpetual lies result in the deaths of millions of people, not yeah. hundreds of thousands. I mean, we, we haven't even chatted about what's happening in Yemen, which is a, which is a disgrace and shames the United Kingdom. Yeah. Genocide, yeah. Genocide overseen by British military officers standing in drone control rooms in Saudi Arabia, 
dropping British made bombs and again Theresa May's husband and his company have a big influence in, well not a big influence but they have a lot to gain again yeah, they just bombed another wedding party in at Yemen and killed 50 people. Yeah, I saw those reports today, yeah. What do you do then, Ian? What are we going to do? Because, let me ask you this. Do you believe that occasion, on occasion in the past, the deep state spy agencies, the MI5, MI6, the NSA, the DVD in Germany, Mossad, do you believe that on occasion they commit murder by way of a false flag, to make it look like somebody else did it, to further an agenda. Do you believe that? Of course they do. Right, well, so let me ask you this. Affair in Egypt in 1956, so I think that it's yeah. in the 1950s, the Lafon Affair, complete false flag, trying to, trying to blame NASA for something. So, there's a follow-up question. Supposing Jeremy Corbyn was to win, and supposing Jeremy Corbyn, supposing I'm wrong about him, because I, I'm, I'm fairly critical of him, Ian. I'd like to believe him, but I don't, sadly. But that's just me. That's just me. A lot of my listeners would totally disagree with me and they tell me regularly. Now, supposing I'm wrong, please God I am. He wins, forms a coalition, whatever, and he comes in and he's absolutely determined. This is it. Enough of it. No more Syria, no more any of that. What's to stop the deep state bombing someplace in the UK, blaming it on ISIS? And then he's got nowhere, he's got nowhere to go then. He's got to do something. Yeah, exactly. They, they can stage it. I mean, this one, this this latest one, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia spent a month going around London, Paris and the United States. What do you think he was discussing with, with spending a month in all those places? He signed lo- billion dollar arms deals. But he, I mean, one of the big subjects that he would be talking about is Syria and Yemen. Isn't it? Undoubtedly. So he's saying, well, Syria's not going very well. We get all the, all my terrorists are getting defeated. What are we going to do about it? I would like to do a false flag. Is that all right with you guys? I know most of oh, that's perfectly all right with our guys. Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and do a false flag. Yes. And uh, Macron said, we're going to go and ask Macron and say, oh, yes, yes, yes. Go ahead and do your false flag. Yes, that's a brilliant idea. Yeah, I love that. And he goes and talks to Pompeo at the CIA or whatever. He says, oh, we want to do a false flag. Oh, yes, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, do, go, go, go. Do a false flag. See, I'm sure it was discussed in the in the in sort of early, you know, when when that, um, MBS was going around all these Europe, the the French, UK, and uh, US capitals. I'm sure he, he discussed doing a false flag because Saudi Arabia funds these terrorists. Let me ask I, you a question, Ian. Let me ask you a question. Ian Schilling is our guest tonight. By the way, it's great to have Ian. On this day of all days, St. George's Day, April 23rd, you can follow Ian on online. It's ian56.blogspot.co.uk and he's at ian56789 on Twitter. He's a journalist, very good writer. Articles are very, very readable, very interesting. And he tweets uh, prolifically uh, about these issues, geopolitics, Syria, and so on, so on, so on. Really interesting stuff. Um, I had a really good question there and it's just gone right out of my head. I'll read some tweets, it'll come back to me. Um, but it was um, on, on, on that line, it was on those lines of, um, of false flags. Um, let me just scroll on down there. Huge amount of tweets coming in here. To follow what people are tweeting, go to twitter.com, put Richie Allen Show into search Twitter, press enter, and you'll see what everybody else is tweeting to me. Uh, Facebook messages coming in as well on uh, this as well. Richard Mace tweets, how you doing Richard? Is it not a bit worrying just how transparent the lies are regarding Syria? What's going on? That's a good question, Ian, because it's almost like the media has given up trying to convince us, for want of a better way of putting it. It's almost it's, it's almost tired. It a... Go ahead. It's still called it rebels and not terrorists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Johnny tweets... Um, that he found that very funny. Actual quote from Corbyn, Israel should stop beating uh, the shit out of Palestine. Ha ha, says uh, Johnny there. Keep those tweets coming in at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. That's at Richie Allen Show on, on Twitter. What are we going to do, Ian? You know, you talked about false flag terrorism there, which has become a part of our lives. I think for most of us, it became a part of our lives on September the 11th. I don't believe the official account of what happened on September 11th, but no, I don't... Nobody with a critical thinking mind does. You no. couldn't. No, now I don't have any answers in terms of what did happen, but I don't believe 19 hijackers 
with Stanley knives. Um, it took over four planes, crashed them into, and then the buildings collapsed. And the, speed of uh, that's right, not 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 a bit of it. So so, for those of us who are a bit more critically thinking minded, we see these false flag terror events, and we recognise their signature. Sometimes, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. What chance do we have, though, in terms of the the, the question I was going to ask you, which was a I think was a decent enough question. Was there, I mean, you, you come from the from the finance background, you've worked all your life. Was there a time in your life when the notion of false flag terrorism would have been completely ridiculous to you and you would have mocked gleefully people who talked about such things? Was there a point in your life when you would have dismissed it out of hand? Yeah, 2000, any time before 2000. 2000. I start. I was playing the stock market as a private trader, and I ran into. I joined a discussion group with that there were also private traders, but they've been stock market traders for thirty years, and they used to work in some some of the big banks, and then they left the big bank and just on their own. Okay, and they were thirty year people, so they started explaining to me because they'd been working in these big banks and stuff. All the fixes, or all, all the all the rigging that goes on by Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan, like, no. Hell, what? Nobody's reporting this. <laughs> and they, t- they told me that the Federal Reserve wasn't a, wasn't a U.S. government institution. It was a private banking card. No, I can't be like, oh, it bloody is. It's right. Oh, dear. <laughs> you didn't know. So I started waking up in all the finance stuff and started understanding how much we've been lied to in the financial and monetary systems. Tell me this, Ian. It is true, isn't it, that... No, no, I think I can say it is true for a fact, but you'll know more about it than me. It is true that in the 10 days or two weeks leading up to September the 11th, stock market bets were made that American Airlines and United Airlines shares would fall. That's, yeah. That is true, isn't it? That is true. It was done through a subsidiary of Deutsche Bank, right? The FBI started investigating where all, they called short trades to bet on a share price going down. OK, they're short trades. So the FBI started, they had, there was an unusual amount of activity of people placing short trades, like 10 times the normal amount on United Airlines or something. OK, so the FBI, that's a bit suspicious, isn't it? We're going to investigate who placed all those bets. So they led to some sort of subsidiary of Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank had got a load of Saudi Arabia Prince clients, OK? So, it's, you know, <laughs> I mean, I can't prove anything, but my my gut feel is that some Saudi princes knew that this was going to happen. They weren't the ruler, right? But obviously they'd heard it from a friend of a friend in the royal family talking to their fellow princes and said, oh, oh is a big event going to come and we're, we're going to hijack airplanes and, and fly them into buildings. What? Oh, uh, uh, which airlines? Oh, well, these are the flights. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll short the airlines. <laughs> we'll short the airlines. Um, that will make you killing. Yeah, and then the then the FBI when they find out the source of these trades, they were they they the FBI found out that they were done done through this Deutsche Bank subsidiary. This is you know investment. You know this VIP investment club or whatever for you know the people who've got ten million dollars to invest or something you know VIP club and uh, and they they went there and said oh this is bloody full, full of Saudis oh can that investigation we don't want to don't want to find out anything about the Saudis can it we're not going to investigate this anymore and they just stopped. Do you know I read an article it might have been by Matt Taibbi in Rolling Stone magazine many years ago and. You're bringing it back to me now, that article, because he pretty much said, um, not in as great detail as you did with regards to Saudis and Deutsche Bank, but he pretty much said that, that there was a refusal to follow the yellow brick road to its inevitable conclusion when they were yeah. checking on 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 the insider trading. But but it is a fact, huge amounts of money. And, and I do understand, Ian. And the other thing about this go is ahead. those trades, the profits on them, which were t- tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, were never claimed. You, you took the words, you took the words out of my mouth. You took no who bet on it, you see. Amazing. You took the words out of my mouth. That's what I was, go- I was going to say that. I was going to say that it was right. alleged that, that certain people, you know, with certain windfalls were, were never claimed. 
in the yeah. aftermath of it. And that was a life changing thing for you then, like it was for me and probably for many people listening to the programme well, tonight. But the real the real life changing event for me was on nine eleven, I'd gone down with a flu a couple of days before and I was feeling really terrible. I was popped out on the couch and really bored and whatever. So I put on, on BBC News and I just to fill in the time. I was doing you know, drinking lem soup and whatever else, trying to get rid of my cold, bad flu I had. So I was sitting on the couch, uh, laying down on a couch, watching it, watching some rubbish news thing, and then all of a sudden it switches over to New York and there's all this building on fire. So I saw the second plane fly into the building live on TV. And then I saw the buildings collapse. I, it fell straight down. It's not right. How can this... Yeah, it, and flew in this side, so that side's going to be weaker, and then it all fell down straight after it. No, 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 no. It, and it all went down really, really quick, didn't it? I've seen controlled demolitions. I've seen sort of sort of apartment buildings of twenty stories high being demolished. I've watched them, you know, from from you know half a mile away on a hillside, and watched how they blow up and how they collapse. Like, that's bloody like that. I watched one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to investigate this because that smells to high heaven to me. So I'm going to investigate what's going on. Well, I'm ash I'm, ash I'm ashamed to tell you that I was working in commercial radio at the time, and rather than question it, I just repeated it. And when we were given press releases alleging that Osama bin Laden did it, and he controlled the operation from a cave in Afghanistan, I'm ashamed to say that we just repeated that. We we read what we were given to read and we didn't ask any questions. It wasn't until several months, I would even say six, seven months later, that I began to think, well, Jesus, this, there's something very wrong with this. But I, I would have seen the same demolition and it should have occurred to me there and then, this is very wrong. But because yeah. of the nature of the job I was doing, not questioning anything, I was like, all right, the man in the cave did it. And we told our listeners that every day. The man in the cave did it. Even yeah. though even though even though Fox News reported two or three weeks after September the eleventh that bin Laden had died because his health had deteriorated so badly because yeah. he had kidney problems that had spread yeah, to he died liver issues. in late December two thousand and one, we Yeah, think. yeah, that's right. Yeah, I should say a couple of months later, not a couple of weeks, that's right. Um, but it took me a little bit longer to start asking questions. Do you think on that, Ian, um, will 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 nine eleven ultimately become like the JFK thing in terms of you and I in ten years' time will still be talking on the radio about well, nine eleven? I, I think so. I think it will be if nine eleven was really exposed and said. Well, I mean the U.S. government. Had a role in it. We don't know exactly who did what, do we? We don't. As we know, we know there's main parties involved in it, and the U.S. government or rogue agents in the U.S. government are involved. And one of those is Dick Cheney, isn't it? So we know, we know, we know the suspects, the main suspects. We don't quite know who did what, do we? We can't prove that, but we know, we know it wasn't an official narrative. It's a complete lie. It's a complete but nonsense. That lie. If fifty percent of the UK population got told that and then believed it, it'd be chaos. The whole system of you know believing in government. I mean, the majority of Brits and the majority of Americans still believe in government. They don't believe that their government could possibly do something so horrendous, a false flag attack that killed three thousand Americans to start a war. They don't believe the American government could be that evil, do they? No, a war which killed more than a million Iraqis and displaced three million more. We're, um, we've got about three or four minutes left on this. Um, Ian Schilling is our guest. So I've got to, before we run out of time, ask about... Here's a question for you now. Um, I'm going to ask everybody this question. Let's see what sort of answers we get. Mr Schilling, sir, where is Yulia Skripal and her father? Where are these people? We don't know. Yulia Skripal is is being held in detention, isn't she? She's being held hostage. It looks like she she is in command communicado. I mean, apparently she's got a fiance in Russia, and she's got her cousin 
and she doesn't want to speak to her fiance or cousin about the most terrible and terrifying event of her entire life. She don't want to speak to them about it. That's that's complete garbage. But, you know, if you'd had a near death experience, somebody, if somebody tried to murder you, and you had a near death experience, and you were in a coma in hospital for two weeks, would you want to go and talk to your brother and sister about it, or your cousin, of or course. your boyfriend? Of course, absolutely. It's the most bizarre story. I thought on Saturday the Russian ambassador to London was was brilliant. Alexander Yakovenko, he he absolutely, as you did on Friday, he absolutely cleaned out the assembled press by asking them, are any of you guys and gals just a little bit curious as to where Yulia Skripal is? Have any of you asked for an interview? Have any of you asked to just, you know, just to get a little glimpse of her? He, he shamed them. It's dreadful. I mean, there was talk of them leaving the country and going to America. You see, somebody, I, I, I'd love to get your I opinion on this. stupid to do that. Yeah. I mean, how, how safe would they be if CIA gave them new identities and put them somewhere up in some nowhere town in mid middle of America? The CIA could bump them off whenever they liked, couldn't they? Here's a, a car accident or a heart attack, break a heart attack, break a car accident, whatever. They wouldn't be safe at all. The only place they're going to be safe is if they go back to Russia. Now. Here's the I scenario. Here's the scenario for you, uh, Ian. Dean Dean Henderson is um, a regular contributor to this program. Uh, Dean is based in Missouri. Really interesting guy. Um, would 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 share a lot of um, your opinions and ideas. And Dean said to me, Richie, I wonder is Skripal still working for MI6 or MI5? And I thought that was. I was kind of, again, surprised. Maybe I'm getting slow oh, in my well, old age. It's perfectly possible. Isn't the whole it? thing is a, is a complete hoax, and they, n neither of them were poisoned with anything. Yeah. What evidence have we got that they were poisoned? There's no pictures of him being in a coma in intensive care in hospital, is there? And you know damn well that if they were ill and they were in hospital, the propaganda value of those pictures would have been exploited, wouldn't oh, well, it? yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let me just read a couple of quick tweets there. Rakoba tweets, Ryan is his name. Richie, brilliant guest is Ian. You should get him on again soon. I'll be inviting Ian back, mm -hmm. um, of course. Um, absolutely. Uh, Rich tweets, um, the lie is still too potent. 9-11 he's talking about. Ian is right. People just don't believe in that their government would do something so terrible. It's very frustrating, um, says Rich. That's true. I've been encountering that on programmes for many years. Uh, Faisal tweets, uh, how you doing Faisal? Uh, talking about the planes and the buildings. It's the way the planes flew right through the building facade <laughs> like it was paper, but not a single piece came out the other side. It looked like uh, a film special effect. There's so many anomalies with the videos. Ian, um, absolutely outstanding bit of journalism on Friday, by the way. Um, politely firmly and professionally calling out the nonsense of Sky News. Well, That's the I thing. About that. No, I it mean, was incredibly I'm polite and professional. Well. No, listen, take it from me. I've been making programmes for years and years and years. If you're going to be on national television and if you're going to take them on, you gave a lesson in how to do it. Be polite, be courteous, but be firm and stick to the point that you want to make. It was um, absolutely brilliant. You can follow Ian. It's um, on Twitter. It's at Ian56789. Totally independent uh, researcher, Ian, tweeting out information on a daily basis. He's not connected to Syria. He's not connected to Russia or anybody else. These are his opinions. I've really enjoyed chatting with you, my friend. I'm going to give you the final word on it. And I will, of course, be asking you back on in the future because I've enjoyed speaking with you and the audience has really enjoyed listening to you. So final word to you, Ian, and then we'll we'll part company. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it was great to have you on, Ian. And once again, it's ian56.blogspot.co.uk. That's where you can read Ian's articles about the Russian bot uh, scandal, which is complete nonsense, of course, but also other articles on Russia, Syria. Well, I don't on believe there is any significant Russian bot activity in UK or America. I think it's all an entire hoax. All this St. Petersburg toll farm turned out to be a commercial clickbait farm that, that took money from Americans to promote, um, you know, tight, you know, small businesses. Yeah. They charged 
twenty-five dollars a, a meme or something to post it out. It's all a load of rubbish. I don't believe that. I mean, the British have got two thousand online social media trolls, and they've all got twenty accounts each. So that that's forty thousand accounts. Okay, across. Facebook and Twitter and Reddit and newspaper comments and whatever else. But, you know, that's 2,000 British trolls. There's 2,000 American trolls. There's 2,000 Israeli trolls. They've all got multiple accounts. And the Russians have got a tiny, tiny government budget. They can't afford it. And most of the time, they're, gonna, they're going to be trying to influence social media on Russian stuff. There's Yandex, isn't it? It's the, it's the equivalent of Facebook or Twitter in Russia. That's got, VK. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah, I mean, they they have enough to be doing domestically without trying to influence the EU referendum or without trying to influence what happens in in America. And it, the irony is so thick you could choke on it. When you've got institutions like Sky News and the BBC accusing other organisations of spreading fake news, it's ridiculous. Ian, thanks so much, mate, for giving us um, so much of your time today. I know you've done something with the BBC. I look forward to seeing that tomorrow. <laughs> so yes. do give us well, a heads I, up I, on it's Twitter. It's not going to be that great because they're going to do a hatchet job on me. Well, this is the worst of the pre-record, you see. This is the I worst put, of the pre-record. I put, out, yeah. I put out on my on my tweet account my full 13-minute interview with the BBC reporter that's putting together the piece for Newsnight tomorrow night. And I don't know how long it's going to be. You know, it's a 10-minute Newsnight segment. Well, you know what they do. All right, but, you're, but you've put out the unedited bit. You recorded it yourself, did you, I while you were doing put, it? Yes. Well, well, I would ask people to, um, to uh, watch that video that I've just put out with my interview with the BBC reporter for Newsnight because it's just as good as the Sky one. You weren't born yesterday, my friend, were you? <laughs> you weren't born yesterday. That's great. So that I you've... put it out before Newsnight airs. People can watch it. And then if Newsnight is trending on Twitter, that, that's not what he bloody said. <laughs> well, do, do me a... Do that's me, what you're accusing him. No, that's not right. Well, See, I put it out a day early. That's brilliantly clever. Do me a favour. When we hang up now, tweet that link on your own Twitter again. Copy well, me in and I'll tweet it around. So I think it's the last tweet I did before I came All on. right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll retweet that now and we can have, I'll have a look at that when I'm finished. A tonic to uh, speak with you, Ian. Thanks so much for coming on and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Okay, it's been great, Richard. Yeah, I'd love to come on again. You'll be invited on again. There's no doubt about it, mate. Cheers for that. Really great to speak with you. Ian Schilling, live on the line there. Do check out that piece that Ian did with Sky on Friday afternoon when the Sky presenters... Um, tried to take him on over this over the allegations that his Twitter account was compromised or that it was a Russian bot account, which of course is nonsense. And how he dealt with that is brilliant. And it is a genuinely excellent example of how to deal with sarcastic, sneery, kind of snarky presenters. It's a brilliant example. Ian Schilling on the line there. Um, and it's at Ian56789 on Twitter.